Today's podcast is brought to you by WebCreatorPros.com. If you're looking for a professional website at an affordable price, head on over to WebCreatorPros.com, type in the promo code TRUTH to save $200 on your first website. WebCreatorPros.com. This episode is also brought to you by Kendall Shoulders and his new book, Jesus is a Worm and a Snake Too, among other things. JesusIsAWorm.com. The book deals with many different prophecies and dark sayings of Jesus, uh, particularly Jesus calling himself a worm and King David prophesying of the coming Christ, calling him a worm too. What does this mean? I know for me personally, when I read over it in the scriptures, I would just kind of read past it and didn't know what it means. For the first time, you're going to find out what it means when Jesus says, I am a worm. It's pretty deep stuff, guys. Check out the book, JesusIsAWorm.com. If you would like to sponsor the show or advertise on the Mythicist podcast, you can do so by going to www.mythicist.me and click on Sponsor the Show for more info. If you would like to support the show financially, you can do that also by going to mythicist.me and become a monthly supporter. We appreciate your monthly support. You are now listening to the Mythicist Podcast, your portal to the paranormal, streaming live at mythicist.me, your hub for all things spiritual, esoteric, and paranormal. And now, your host, Truth Seeker. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Mythicist Podcast. Today, we're speaking with Kendall Shoulders. We're speaking about biblical prophecy. And this is somebody who has dedicated his life to searching the scriptures and finding out the true meaning of some of these somewhat esoteric prophecies in the scriptures and what they're talking about. So I know I've given my life to studying the scriptures and being a biblical theologian myself. I understand that many of the uh, prophecies and many of the um, terminologies that were given from the mainstream church. It, you know, it doesn't line up with the scriptures. Like if, if you're a student of the word, it's not hard to read some of these prophecies and say, hey, that's not talking about that. But whenever we bring up some of these subjects to the lay church people or some of the pastors and things like that, it seems like they have a agreed upon theology that even though the scriptures may teach something totally different that we can't come against it or they can't open their mind to these new paradigms of what the scriptures really mean. And some of it is very blatant. So that's why I wanted to have Kendall shoulders on the show. He's got a couple books out. We're going to talk about that and we're really going to get into biblical prophecy and uh, some of these strange esoteric sayings that Jesus said himself and even some of the ones in the old Testament that point back to Jesus. So we're going to talk about that. Um, Kendall shoulders. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on your show. Yeah, definitely. We were talking just before the show that you're from Alabama. I'm from Alabama as well. We're not too far away from each other. Yeah, it's great, man. I didn't know you were a fellow Alabamian until earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, down here in Mobile, definitely, man, where the weather is just crazy. Freezing cold one day and <laughs> humid and hot the next, man. Shoot. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier uh, today. It's it's the sign of the times, you know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. It's crazy whenever you have a hot Christmas. <laughs> That's what I judge everything off of, like the hot Christmas and the hot Thanksgiving, man. It's like, no, yeah. I can't. I can't stand it. Had a few days of uh, really cold weather, and the rest of it's you know been kind of warm. Yeah. So I want to I want to talk to you, man. I read your bio, and um, I read about some of the books that you have out, and I just want to ask you, just from your perspective, like, how did you get into studying biblical prophecy, and what does it mean to you? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of along the same lines as you are in, in, in the traditional thinking. There was just a lot of questions that. You know, I had growing up and, and I would ask those questions and you would get the typical answer and, you know, no, no real insight on what, you know, it, what the true word was meaning, especially when it came to the Old Testament. You know, you get brushed off or mm -hmm. people give you any kind of answer that they feel like they wanted to and you go away empty because you didn't feel that, uh, you know, you know, that, you know, if, if this is really God, if God is who he say he is, he's got to be bigger He's got to be bigger than what uh, you're telling me. And so I uh, probably back in the mid to late 90s, 
you know, I, I really went on the journey because I, I, I said, you know, to, uh, to the Lord, I said, if, if, you, if you're real and I believe you're real, I said, it's got to be more to this than what I'm being told. And so I went on my, uh, started on my journey and, um, you know, I started finding things out in the scripture that didn't quite line up with, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what we were being taught on the traditional level. And, uh, you know, I got real curious. Uh, my, my fire was burning to learn more and more. And the more I learned, uh, the more I wanted to learn. Mm-hmm. And at one point I was studying uh, the, the tabernacle. And um, in the process of studying the tabernacle, I got some study materials. It was from one guy in, uh, I think he's in Oregon, uh, by the name of John uh, Corson. And he was doing a study on the tabernacle, and I was trying to uh, see what he had to say about it. And he mentioned something that that uh, kind of blew my mind. He mentioned uh, this tola worm, and and so when I began to study this tola worm, it kind of it, it blew me literally blew me away. And so I went throughout the scriptures, uh, even in the late nineties, and I began to see um, where this worm would turn up all throughout scripture. And then I went from there and I began to look at the, how the tabernacle and, and all of these things, even the, the, the people in the Bible uh, that, that God chose are pointing to him. And it was absolutely amazing. And not just in general, I mean, specifically it's pointing to him. And so when he says stuff like, you know, uh, he said, I think it was in Luke 24, he began to talk about how he said that the, that the books of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets uh, were talking about me. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at that, the, the Psalms, the prophets, and the books of Moses, that's that's what we call uh, the Old Testament. And so uh, I began to look at it from a different perspective. You know, this whole thing is really just about him. Yeah. And so if he said he's the word, then the whole word is referring to mm-hmm. him. And so... Uh, his plan, uh, past and future, uh, are all tied up uh, in the Old Testament. If you want to know what he's going to do, all you have to do is look at what he's yeah. already done. You know, yeah. and it's, it's there to be searched out. And so that's really what started me on my journey. Yeah. Um, the more you study the Old Testament, and not just read it, you have to study and and you know, um, actually relate precept upon precept, line upon line. And I would encourage people too to, if you are a student of the word, get you a um, a Bible that has down the center margin the uh, text that it's talking about in the Old Testament. It shows you the reference. So, like what I found is stuff that we don't even know happened in the Old Testament. Almost everything in the New Testament is taken from the Old Testament. Exactly. Almost everything. I know there's some of the big prophecies where they're quoting and it shows it in italics and they're actually quoting the Old Testament. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about some of the wordplay that Jesus and Paul used that's straight out of the Old Testament. It's like, wow, like, because I think we kind of read it and think that they made it up as they were going and it was <laughs> exactly. something new or whatever. But no, they're just quoting the Old Testament, you know? Yeah, I, you know, and, and Jesus makes these statements, you know, like, you know, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And so when he says things like that, you, you have to take into consideration, <laughs> what is he talking about? What does it mean he came to fulfill it? And so as I began to study scripture, I began to understand that the Mosaic law uh, was simply, uh, was not God's law. It was an explanation of God's law. Mm-hmm. And so he uses the Mosaic law uh, pictures and shadows and type to explain the essence of, 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 of the true law. And really mm-hmm. the law of the Torah is really, uh, you know, is, is basically God's character. Cause when you yeah. get in the new Testament, he says that, that the, uh, uh, the law is spiritual. And yeah. so we know that, that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm-hmm. And so if that's the case, then the, the law itself, as we said, is simply God's character. Who, who would I be if I were a man? Would I be the same as I am now? You know, and so he's, he's like, if I was a man, you know, I wouldn't sleep with my neighbor's wife. Yeah. If I was a man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie 
or make false witness against my neighbor. If I was a man, I would love the Lord thy God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. And so he's telling us who he would be. His character in heaven would be, uh, on earth would be the same. As, yeah. you know. And so, uh, you know, and that's how we have to look at it. And so when we begin to take on the character of God, it's not about following a bunch of rules. Mm-hmm. It's just an automatic thing that if you're following the Spirit, the character of God comes out. So if I'm following the Spirit of God, walking in the spirit of God, it is impossible for me then to sleep with your wife. Yeah. It is impossible for me then to bear false witness against you. And so uh, the the idea of keeping the law uh, then is, is null and void because you're, you're, you're by default keeping the law by walking yes. in the spirit. Man, you know what? That's a heavy revelation. It took me years to get to that because after, you know, getting born again, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, set on fire for God. Um, eventually, I just wanted to study and study and study. And I actually ran into some friends who were into Messianic Judaism. Mm-hmm. And we ended up getting involved with that. And because I just liked the way it was, it was from like all the crazy charismatic stuff of you know, at the time, people rolling on grounds and sp- speaking in tongues, standing on the pews, jumping and hollering, all of this stuff going on. Um, I wanted something different. So I was around the Messianic people and they were like real solace or whatever. It was just like this personal communion with like, you know, different, um, uh, I guess, ceremonies or whatever, keeping Shabbat, keeping the Sabbath and things like that. Something that's like a real reverence, but it was still spiritual at the same time. So we ended up getting into that. And it was the emphasis was on keeping the law. The emphasis, the emphasis was on, um, you know, if you if you do this, if you don't eat pork, if you don't eat shellfish or whatever, then then you're closer to God. And it became, you know, it became about this, you know, I guess what the Pharisees were dealing with. They had this outward appearance of holiness, but inside them, they were, you know, dry bones. They were dead people. They were empty sepulchers, as the scripture says. And so we did that for a years man we were you know uh, shoot, probably about eight or nine years or whatever and we ended up you know pulling away from all of the the different um traditions as far as christmas and thanksgiving i would fast on thanksgiving and all of these things and we were trying not to be a part of this worldly system or whatever that's already established but then years and years of studying and studying just asking god to reveal himself and the deeper and deeper i found is exactly what you just said that the whole law Everything, not just the law, not just the commandments, but the prophets and everything, just as Jesus simply said, hangs upon love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart um, and love your neighbor as yourself. These two things that if you're walking in total love for all humanity, for God, for nature and for your body, you're going to naturally do the things that are written of in that law. So instead of you having this checklist of I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. This, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us and teaches us how to walk in the spirit. And by nature, we will keep the commandments of God because the New Testament or the new covenant is he's written that law, all of those commandments on our hearts. So when we steal, we don't have to be told that we, you know, we've done wrong because we know in our hearts that we've had to reason within ourselves and, and, and try to manipulate to steal or to lie. We know when we're not telling the truth, it's that conviction that's in our hearts or whatever. So, that being said off the back, man, that keeping the commandments and all of that is just simply walking in love for all creation, man. So definitely big up so on that. I'm looking forward to you getting into some deeper discussion with you on that. And also, before we go too far, I know we're going to tie it into the, the worm prophecies and things like that. But And, and I'm not sure if you're going to go this direction, but I definitely wanted to touch on it and, and see if this is if, if you've done any research on this. But. We see um, in the Old Testament these different mentions of worms and things. And the ancients believed that these different parasites and and worms were actual demonic entities. There's different prayers from the ancients um, that they were banishing worms out of their bodies because they felt like these worms were these parasites that got into the human body and caused us to have disease and, and make us sick and things like that. And so there's a lot of emphasis on these dragons and these worms and things like that being some type of entities as well. Have you done any studying on that? No, I haven't uh, done a major study on 
on how they uh, looked at at the particular worm. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, there's two main uh, words used in the uh, in the Hebrew language for worm, and that's one of them is rima, and one of them is the tola worm. And I, I think I think that uh, the basis of of the argument is good because when you look at the the rima worm, it always points to some type of destruction or some type hmm. of decay. Or yeah. um, you know, or, taken away. Yeah, it, it it always points to that. And then when you look at the Tola worm, it always points to the Messiah. And so uh, you even find these two uh, words for worm in in the same uh, scripture at times. One of them referring to the defeat of Satan himself when he ends up in the in the pits of hell. Hmm. It said that uh, you know the, the worms will will take over him, but at the same time. Uh, he'll be covered by the Tola worm. And so that's a reference to him being defeated by uh, the blood of Christ. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. But, I mean, it's, it's a powerful uh, image, you know, when you begin to talk about the two different worms that, that's in the Bible. Yeah, let's get into that because like I was stating with, you know, with the, uh, the demonic and, uh, you know, the worm being a picture of something that takes away from you. And there's different prophecies and blessings where the scriptures say that, the Lord will restore unto you these different things that the worms have taken yes. away from you. And, yes. you know, mm -hmm. the worms come and destroy your crops and things like that. So and so we see it in this, this uh, you know, negative light, this demonic light. I've personally never heard it in the positive light of how it would be something of restoration or something that was talking about the coming of Christ. So let's go into that now to just paint this picture of what you've seen through prophecy of how, these mentions and references of these wor worms were something positive and something that represented Christ. Yeah. I mean, when you study like uh, Psalms 22 and it, you know, if you're really into uh, uh, the messianic prophecies and stuff, yeah, definitely. you know that, that Psalms 22 is really a uh, uh, um, uh, foreshadowing of the crucifixion yeah. of, of Christ. And so when you know that and you go in and you begin to study that you see him saying in verse one, like my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And you fast forward a thousand years later, there's there's our, uh, Yeshua on the cross saying, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? You know, uh, he, he's talking about the people uh, passing by and shooting their lip out and shaking their head at him. And, you know, when you go to the uh, thousand years later, guess what? He's on the cross and they're shooting their lips out and they're shaking their head at him. You know, he, he talks about the bulls of, uh, of Bashan, you know, surrounding him. And, and of course, if, if you study the spiritual ram, and I, I really love that book by uh, uh, Dr. Heiser, when, you know, and yeah. you talk about the bulls of Bashan, uh, you're, you're talking about the fallen uh, entities uh, that, uh, you know, tried to take over the throne of God. And so even they were around the cross, according to Psalms 22. Uh, he, he talks about him being thirsty and he talks about uh, they cast lots for my garments. And we know that all of these things were prophetic of what, yeah. of, what surrounded the cross. But then there was this one that struck me in there when he said, I am a worm. So if this is a messianic prophecy, then we have to inquire if he says, I am a worm, what is he talking about? Why would he call himself a worm? And so uh, when you look into that, uh, he's this particular word for worm in Hebrew is, is the Tola worm, as we mentioned before. What's so awesome about this worm is that when it when it got ready to give birth to its young, it would uh, it would end up uh, crawling up on on the side of a tree, and then it would uh, you know begin to uh, uh, give birth to its young, and it would get, it would deposit the eggs beneath its body. So that it would protect them while they were uh, uh, beginning to mature. It would allow the young, while it was alive, to eat of its body so that they could uh, mature and grow. And wow. so it would die in the process of, of, of mm. its young eating of the body. That's All great. the time while it's eating of the body, they're being protected. Then what's amazing is that the blood, as they were eating, would coat their bodies and they would be forever stained in their lifetime with the blood of the parent that was protecting them and feeding them uh, with with his body. And so, when the the when the uh, young matured, they would develop these wings, and the males would, and they would fly off. Okay, and the carcass of the tree would remain on the tree, and it would eventually fall off the tree. And when it fell off the tree, it would leave this red crimson dot on the tree. 
And when you, it, what's amazing, if you came back three days later, this red crimson dot will have turned white. Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And so when, when Jesus comes and he says in this messianic prophecy, I am but a worm, then he was referring to the work that he, he was going to do for us. He was referring mm -hmm. to this tola worm. And he was saying, I am the true tola worm. I am the one that's going to attach myself to a tree. I am the one who uh, yeah. who's going to give birth to uh, my people uh, while I'm on the tree. And as you know, when he was on the tree, he was pierced in the side, and out of his side came blood and water, which which two things are significant of birth. You know, at every yeah. birth, you always have blood, and you always have the breaking of the uh, of the water. And so then he he does an amazing thing, just like the Tola worm. He tells us. Uh, he leaves this uh, this this nice ordinance with us. We call it an ordinance, but it's, it's supernatural in a way. He says, uh, I want you to take this bread. This represents my body. And I want you to take the wine. I want you to drink it. And so just like the Tola worm uh, allowed its young to eat of its body in order to survive. Now, Yeshua comes along and tells us to eat of his body so that we can survive during this lifetime. So he also washes us in his blood, just like the, uh, the larva of the tola worm. When they begin to eat of the body, they were forever stained in their parents' blood. Once we're washed in the blood of Jesus, we're forever stained. We're forever washed, you know, from our, our sin, you know. And, and the thing about it, like uh, when it fell off the tree, it would leave this red crimson dot on the tree. And three days later, you come back and it's white as snow. Well, that's what uh, Jesus had prophesied. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, he said, I will make them white as mm, snow. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. And so every time you see this Tola worm in Scripture, he's always pointing to the work of the Messiah. And it's hitting in this text in one word. I mean, just one word. You could study for years just on this one word, and there's no denying. I mean, if you just study Psalm 22 and you see the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, it's mathematically impossible for one man to fulfill all the things that he did just in Psalms 22. Yeah. And so when you add all the other things that we'll probably discuss as we go along, he leaves no doubt as to who he is and what his purpose was. Even through like something as as what we would think as trivial as a worm, he's talking about himself. And so when he says that the that the the, the law of Moses and the Psalms and the, and the prophets are speaking to me, I mean, who can deny it when one word worm, the Tola worm, is pointing directly at him? Yeah. Now, was this something that the Lord gave you? exclusively or or have you studied under someone else that has the same revelation now the the concept of the worm like i said i learned it from uh it was a uh, i heard john corson okay uh discuss it when he was talking about the uh, the tabernacle now the 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 revelation of it throughout scripture he gave me directly uh-huh um uh, uh, so I went throughout scripture. I mean, it was the, the concept of the computer was awesome to me because I, I was able to go in <laughs> yeah. and, and it wasn't like I, I used to have this concordance, uh, and I had to look through the book and, yeah. and, and try to do all this stuff, man. And then I, uh, a friend gave as a gift, gave me some software and I could go in and do word studies and I could do, I could put in one Hebrew word and it would search the whole scripture for me. Yeah. And so when I when I did that, one of the terms that I was able to search out was the Tola worm. And I saw every instance where uh, it appeared. I didn't get the instant revelation of each one of them right then. But over the years, you know, Lord opened up my eyes to each one of the ones that I explained in the book and, and what the purpose was. And so that's what prompted me to, to write the book, because it was such a powerful revelation, at, you know, everywhere that this worm began to appear in Scripture. Well, the name of the book is Jesus is a Worm and a Snake Too, among other things. And that's what we're talking about. And I know you go into a lot more um, details within the book, but I guess the second part of the title, and he's a snake too. Like, what's the revelation <laughs> you got from that? 
Because <laughs> we always see, you know, the enemy as being the snake and the serpent and things like that, which I, I know that's not always the case, but I know in Christendom, that's that's the first thing we think of when we hear serpent. We don't think of wisdom as the ancient scene of the serpent being a symbol of wisdom, you know. So, yeah, what's, well, yeah. what's your take on I, that? I think I think the, the, the basic premise of that is correct. It, it is a it is an evil thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the serpent, it, 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 it doesn't point to anything. Uh, positive as far as uh, the the work that it does, and so you know, of course, I, I get pushed back because I, I said it. But the reality of it, I didn't I didn't call Jesus a worm, and I didn't call him a snake. He called himself yeah. uh, those things. And so when we when we begin to look at that, uh, the 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 concept of the of the serpent or the snake came up uh, when the children of Israel are coming. They were in the wilderness, and they had been murmuring and complaining, and, and finally, you know, God had gotten tired of it, and he sent serpents through uh, the wilderness, and they began to bite the children of Israel. And so many people began to die, and they asked Moses if he would somehow intercede on their behalf for them because they had sinned against God. Well, what happened was that God intervened and he told Moses, he said, look, I want you to take this the, one of the serpents that's biting and killing the people. I want you to take one and I want you to put it on this stick. It was a, a, a brass or bronze stick. And he said, I want you to hold it up. And when you hold it up, he said, everybody who will look on that serpent will be saved. But those who continue to look on the serpents on the ground will continue to die. And so that's what happened. He held it up. They looked at it and and believed in by faith in the work that Moses was doing with the serpent, and they were saved by that. Well, when you get over into the New Testament, Jesus refers back to that uh, scripture, and he was basically saying, I am the one, I was the one being represented on that stick that Moses held up. And he says, as, you know, just as that serpent was held up, on the stick in the wilderness, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto me. And so we say, well, how can, you know, he equate himself to a, a serpent? And and it's confusing at first until we understand the work that he did. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he had to become sin, the scriptures say for mm -hmm. us. He who knew no sin uh, was made sin. And we have to ask ourselves, what does sin look like? You know, people have, have gotten offended by this, and that's okay to be offended that the, the God we love, the Messiah, you know, uh, became a, like a serpent. Uh, but he had to do it because me and you had all these issues and problems and, and, and sin upon us. And in order for him to take that away, he took it upon himself, and he became just like the enemy so that me and you might be saved. And so what does sin look like? So he said himself he was made sin, and we know that the image of sin all throughout Scripture is the serpent. And so when he says he was just like this serpent, you know, that was uh, on that stick, you know, that's what, that's what he means. He became a snake for us. And, you know, you also see that picture um, uh, with, with Moses and, and the staff when he went in to, uh, to talk to the Pharaoh. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Yeah, you remember that? And he yeah. and he took his. Uh, God had told him to take his staff. And, and well, first God demonstrated to him at the bush. He said, "This is what I want you to do. I want you to put your staff down. And when you put the staff down, it turned into a serpent." And he said, "Now I want you to take it by the tail." And then when he picked it up, it turned back into the staff. Well, we understand that that the rod, you know, always represents you know the the power of God, the right hand of God. And all throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, when you hear, you know, at my right hand or by my right hand, it's it's uh, just a reference to the Messiah, you know, because he, he tells, he said, the Lord said to my Lord. Mm -hmm. He always said to Adana, I believe is, is how I had to go back and look mm -hmm. at it. But it's God saying to God, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so we know that the right hand always points to the Messiah. And so, you know, Moses puts forth his right hand as God commanded it. Well, Christ put forth his right hand of power through, uh, uh, God put forth his right hand of power through uh, Jesus for day. And then Moses put the rod, which literally means stretched out. And it was dead because it had been disconnected from its source. And he laid it down. Okay. Well, Jesus did the same thing. He said, no man take, uh, taketh my life, but I lay it down. 
And he was literally separated from his source of power. And that's why when he was on the cross, he said, into your hands, I, I commend my spirit. He gave up his power in order to save us because he took on our sin. And he was stretched out on the cross, you know. And so he put, he cast a rod to the ground and became a serpent, you know. And God cast Jesus to the earth to become sin for us on the cross. So Moses took the serpent by the tail and picked up the serpent again. And then once Jesus had paid the price for our sins, went to hell, he was quickened by the Holy Spirit. And he said, no man taking my life, but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll pick it back up again. So this whole idea of, of Moses picking the staff back up is representative of Christ picking uh, his life back up uh, for us. So he became a serpent. And, and one more picture with the serpent. When Moses went to talk to Pharaoh, he put his staff down and it became a serpent. But his serpent devoured the serpents of Pharaoh when they put their staff down. And so that was a picture of our uh, uh, our uh, God devouring sin on our behalf so, you know, so we might live. I mean, it's a beautiful picture once, once you're able to see that. I want to go to a quick break. And then when we get back, I want to talk to you a little bit about how some of your colleagues and, and people, some of the different reactions that you've got from some of uh, those who are into biblical prophecies and some of the church people as well. So we're going to take a quick break and be right back. Talk about that on the other side. When you're in business, you need a professional website. When you visit WebCreatorPros.com, you can have the website you've always wanted without spending thousands of dollars. For just $799, you can have a professionally designed website, a registered domain name, SEO optimization, one-year hosting, and a website store. Use the promo code TRUTH and save $200. What an incredible deal. Everything you will ever need for your website at a price you can afford. Go to WebCreatorPros.com. There's a new book on the market that's turning the traditional religious circles upside down. The name of this book is Jesus, Yeshua is a worm and a snake too, among other things. Yes, you heard me correctly. Jesus, Yeshua is a worm and a snake too, among other things. The theme of this book is based upon a little known ancient messianic prophecy in Psalm 22, where Jesus refers to himself as a worm. Whether you are religious or not, the information contained in this new book is life changing at worst. One reviewer states, Wow, what an interesting and engrossing book. I was fascinated with the writing from the word go. This has been the single best read on the various aspects of the Bible that lay people need help with to understand and appreciate. Listen, if you are interested in throwing away traditional thinking and learning the truth of biblical prophecy, get your copy of Jesus is a Worm and a Snake Too, among other things, from Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and many online bookstores. You can also visit the author page at www.kshoulderpfg.com. All right, we're back and we're talking with Kendall Shoulders about Jesus being a worm, a snake, and all types of other things, which he said he was. So we're going into detail about that. I hope you guys are enjoying this show. Kendall, I wanted to ask you about the different um, feedback you've been getting from people. Is it, um, you know, with, with, with something by this title and in this type of controversy, I can go ahead and tell you right now, when I, I mentioned that I was going to have you on the show, I had some, some brothers like, Oh, are you sure you want to have that? Do you even know what he's talking about? What is he, is he teaching something that's contrary to what you believe? Blah, blah, blah. And, um, uh, so I already know, you know, as far as the title goes with controversy and things like that, what has been some of the different feedback you've been getting from people, good and bad. Let's hear some of it. Well, uh, from from a, a good standpoint, uh, you know, some people who would not have even been interested, you know, in in uh, looking at uh, uh, Christ, you know, they saw that and they said, well, let me see what this guy is talking about. And so from that perspective, it, it's been good. And then I've had people ask me, what do you mean? You know, especially people that know me and know my belief system, they'll ask me, what do you mean? Uh, you know, and it gives me an opportunity to explain it. And when I do, they're blown away yeah. by it, yeah. you know. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I've had, uh, I've had, uh, emails and, and different things of people saying, how dare you? Yeah. And, you know, how dare you depict my God like that? And how dare this and how dare that? And then, you know, I've had, uh, people tell me that, uh, you know, they, you know, they understand what I'm saying, but I could have done it a different way. And, uh, uh you know, but, you know, I prayed on it before I did it. 
and I, I you know, I even with the publisher and we were gonna change the name and then the Lord just told me, No, I don't want you to change it. Yeah. You know, you got you do it like I'm telling you to do it. And he said, Because what I'm telling you is truth. Yeah. And he said, I'm the one that said it. He said, so it's not about you trying to paint a picture of me that makes you feel good. It's about you painting a picture of me that I want you to paint. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, if we don't show people the depths of what Christ went through on the cross and what he actually became on our behalf, then we'll never get the concept of what he's talking about. And that was what he was trying to tell Peter. Uh, he said, look, if, if when he got ready to wash their feet, we have to understand he washed all their feet, even Judas's feet, which he himself said was the devil. Yeah. And so he humbled himself to the point where he washed everybody's feet, even the devil, in order for, so that me and you might understand the depths to which he was kneeling down for us. And so he knelt down. He, he took off all his clothes and wrapped himself up in linen. And Peter was like, no, no, don't do it. And he said, if I don't do this, you won't have any part with me. And so he said, well, then wash me all over. And so he, he, what he was saying was, if, if I don't show you the depths to what I'm willing to go through in order to save you, then you won't under, truly understand the concept. He said, the idea of me being on the cross with a, just a couple of little pierced holes, a good-looking Greek guy with his head tilted over and barely any blood and covered in a little um, garment, he said, is a lie. Is a lie that is is not backed up by scripture. It's a lie of the image of what I went through. Uh, it, it's, it's just not true. And so many of the reasons why we're ineffective in the church because we would rather hold on to our traditional view, yeah. which he said makes the word of God a non effect, rather than just telling it like it is, you know. And so we want to tell people lies about the church and still expect them to come in and accept Christ. And they're calling us out on those lies right now. Yeah. And so. Uh, you know, how can we expect people then to to accept the God that we say we serve, but we won't even tell them the whole truth about him? Yeah. yeah but, yeah, I've, I've gotten, um, you know, some great responses and I've gotten negative responses, but I knew that before going into it. Yeah. But he said, take up your cross. He said, they've killed plenty of my messengers. You may not be any different. So you just got to do what you yeah. got to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're in good company. That's for one thing. And I want to say that you're doing a great job of explaining it. And it, I think it makes perfect sense. And I think it's a beautiful picture of the work that Christ did for us. And, you know, what I'm saying the picture of the worm is perfect because I've never seen it. I've never heard anybody talk about it. And so as I was a little leery coming into the conversation with you, just wanting to know your stance on it. Where do you stand with, with Christ and all that kind of stuff? But it's a beautiful picture. It's a perfect picture. And the whole thing about it, I think it's beautiful, too, because what you said that um, some of those in the church may not want to hear about it. They may be confused or whatever. But when you talk to them about it, you know, when they see it at first glance, oh, he says Jesus is a worm. Oh, I'm not listening to it. But when you can actually sit down and, and they'll give you the time of day to break it down, show them in the scriptures and show them, you know, the reason, the reasoning behind it, the prophetic picture that it paints, you win them over every time if they'll hear you, you know, I've noticed yeah. that too. I've noticed that too. And then at the same time, on the other hand, those who are looking for truth, those who are you know, searching for God or, or, or just searching for something, you know, that they don't even know what they're looking for. It opens up the door for you to present the message of the cross to them, you know? And so on this show, man, we have so many different people um, who are listening. So many people on here that we just give a platform and, and, you know, quite literally a lot of people who represent a lot of different belief systems and things like that. So there's a lot of people listening. What would you tell somebody um, the significance of Christ going to the cross. Like, why do we need Jesus on the cross? Why? Like, I think there's a lot of people who feel like they don't need Jesus or whatever, or it may be a, a, a fable. So, yeah. I, I, yeah. That's, that's an excellent point. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I would say this, that, you know, the reality of it is, you know, we have to understand as people that in order to be in the presence of God, we have to be perfect. And the problem with being perfect is that none of us are, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and so, I mean, we got this real dilemma going on. We got a God who really wants to spend time with us, but yet he can't because we're imperfect. You know, how am I going to handle that situation? 
And so that's, uh, uh, you know, another part of the second book. Now, I, you know, I put two books in one. So you don't have to, if you, you don't have to buy two books, okay. you just buy the one, Jesus is a Worm, and it covers both of the books. Awesome. So I just really want people to have the information mm -hmm. I'm not about. So uh, going back to the, to the point, we have to go back, you know, in the book of Romans, the book of Romans tells us that Adam is a picture of Christ. And this is in, in my book. And, and so when you study Adam, then you realize that Adam himself describes the work of salvation that Christ is going to do. And this really explains uh, the, the question. If, 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 if I got a little time, I'll, I'll yeah. try to explain. Uh, Adam was made perfect. He wasn't born like Christ, but he was made perfect. And he was made and God formed him and then he blew into him the Holy Spirit and he, he became alive. And so he was so anointed that, uh, you know, he didn't, he walked around in the glory of God and he didn't even know he was naked. And that's pretty anointed, you know. And so God made a covenant with Adam uh, before he pulled Eve out of Adam. And, and he made a covenant with him and he told him, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And one of the concepts that we had to understand was that is that when the, the covenant was made with Adam and not Eve. And the image was that when God pulled Eve out of Adam, he covered her. And so, uh, you know, he, he put Adam to sleep and it was on the sixth day that he put Adam to sleep in order to bring forth uh, his bride Eve. Well, it was on the sixth day uh, that, uh, that Christ was uh, put to sleep on Passover uh, for his bride. And so, he was pierced in the side, and out of his side came blood and water. Well, Adam was pierced in the side, you know, for his bride. He was wounded uh, mm -hmm. for his bride. He shed blood uh, for his bride, That's and true. his bride was pulled out of the side, just like we were pulled out of the side of Christ. And so um, they were walking around, and Eve, she messed up. She sinned, but nothing happened. Their eyes weren't open. They still didn't know that they were naked. None of those things happened because the covenant was not with Eve. The covenant was made with Adam. Did she know uh, that it was wrong? Yeah, of course she knew it was wrong because he had told her the covenant that had been made between uh, him and God. So she ate of the tree and nothing happened. It didn't, it, you know, so he was still able to cover her. So if you want to look at him like kind of a, a intermediary between her and God, no, he was that. He covered her. As long as he didn't fall, she was good. And that's a concept that we have to understand. As long as he didn't fall, she was good because God was looking at her through him because the covenant was made through him. But lo and behold, he, he fell for his bride just like Christ fell for his bride, intentionally fell. And so you say, well, Adam fell for his own sin, and then Christ fell for our sins. You know, he, and so you know the parallels are still there. But what happened was, once they fell, the glory left, and the spirit of God left Adam and Eve. That was their spiritual death, and the essence of God Himself actually left left their bodies. And so God came down and He made a promise to them, and this is what He did: He took He took animals, and He killed the animals. And he literally took the skins of those animals, those bloody skins of those animals, and he covered Adam and Eve up in those animal skins. And he executed judgment on the animal. The animals were innocent. Adam and Eve were guilty. But he's making a promise to them. And he's saying, this is how I'm going to save you. I'm going to kill something innocent so that the guilty can live. And so he made a great exchange between that which was guilty and that which was innocent so that the innocent would die for the guilty and the guilty could live because of the innocent. And so he covered them in the innocence of those skins. And so now when he looked at them, he was able to see the future promise of his work. And he was saying something innocent died so that they might live. And so they were living on the promise of God's grace and mercy because they were saying, I believe that you're going to provide a way out for this. And this is the, in the manner that you're going to do it. Jesus comes along and he says, I am the lamb of God. And he goes all the way back to Adam. I'm the one who is innocent. 
And I'm going to take my righteousness and put it up on you. And I'm going to take your sins and I'm going to put it up on me. And so we have to have a substitute in order for us to stand before God. Our price has to be paid in order for us to stand before God. And it doesn't matter what that is. You could have kept 99.9% of the law, but it's that 0.1% that's going to mess you up because he said if you're guilty of one part of it, you're guilty of all of it, and it has to be perfection itself. And the only way that we can be perfect is we have to accept the sacrifice that Christ made for us, and he imputes righteousness upon me and you. He just makes us okay. By no work of our own, he makes us okay, and he puts us on the proper foundation, and he empowers us with his Holy Spirit. And so that that's why we need salvation because we can't stand before him on our own. And we have to be able uh, uh, to accept the sacrifice that he made. And we can't work our way in it. We can't fake our way in it. You know, we can't, it, it doesn't matter what we do unless we accept the sacrifice that he made, which is to me is, it's the easiest thing for to be done to say, look, I know I've lied. I know I cheated. I know I slept with somebody I shouldn't have slept with. I know I did this. I know I did that. I can't get to God on my own, but I have someone who actually covers me in himself and he takes up on all my imperfections. I mean, I don't know how anybody could turn that deal down. What's the argument, you know? And so he, he shows us through Adam, and Eve and the, and the killing of those animals, exactly the manner in which he was going to uh, uh, save us. And so I would tell anybody who thinks that they can get into uh, the presence of God because they're good, uh, uh, they're being fooled by the enemy. If, if, if you know, we can, tell, we can go to God and we can give him a list of things, just like the man went to Jesus and he said, uh, I've kept the law and I've done this and I've done that and I've done this. And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, you're right. You've done all those things. He said, but there's one thing I'd like for you to do for me. He said, take all your riches, because he was a rich man. He said, take everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor. And the man went away distraught. And the one law that he, he didn't know that he had an issue with was that he loved his stuff more than he loved God. And that's the first commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And so he couldn't get in because he kept all of the other law, but he couldn't keep that one thing. And so he went away distraught and the disciples were like, well, who then can get into heaven? And he said, well, for, for, for men, this is impossible, but for God, all things are possible because I'm going to take care of this thing for you. He says, it's easier for a, a, a man, a, 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 a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man uh, to uh, get into the kingdom. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he won't accept the salvation plan because he thinks that, uh, he's good on his own and not good because God just makes him good. Wow. And so we need we need our righteousness imputed up on us. Mm -hmm. We can't earn that. And we have a God that loves us so much that he took on uh, all, all, all his, our sins upon himself. He came like a serpent for us, went to the depths of hell on our behalf, suffered for us so we wouldn't have to suffer. But the scriptures say that, you know, they couldn't find any fault in him once he paid the price for our sin. Then he was able to cross that great gulf and he was able to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. And when he got up, he got up with all power in his hand. That's awesome that you link that back to Adam and Adam being the picture of Christ. We know the scriptures call Jesus the second Adam. Right. And he's basically the one that came to make everything right that Adam messed up. So that's, right. that's good. And I think the revelation I just got where you were talking about, you know, the rich young ruler or, or whatever, the guy who came up, who had the money. That's like he was almost like showing him the uh, the situation before the cross. Right. Like he was saying, OK, look, I'm ready. I'm good. I'm fine. You know, let me into the kingdom. I've done the work. I've done the it's like. I've done the spiritual training. I've searched my, my life or whatever and got everything out. I'm ready to ascend type deal. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he tells him like, look, you know, that's not the way you get in because you've already messed up. You know, you've already broken one part, but, um, it doesn't go on to show that, you know, that when he went to the cross, that those things changed. And so the way that you enter would not be of your own righteousness sake as this person was trying to get in because of his own righteousness or he, he, you know, he did the work. He's a good person. You don't get in that way. You get in by submitting to Christ, to uh, accepting the work that he did upon the cross and repenting of your sins. And 
that I, I wanted to kind of touch on this a little bit too because you you kind of mentioned it. My big thing right now, it's always been honestly, but right now it's just the emphasis on intimacy with God, just spending personal time in communion with just you and God. And you mentioned that God wants to spend time with you. Right. And so that concept, even to many Christians, can be um, foreign. You know, they may have not heard of that. I've had some powerful spiritual encounters. And so, I mean, I talk about my spiritual encounters openly. And um, I've had some really amazing experiences, some some experiences that I can't explain. Um, I deal with a lot of New Agers. I deal with a lot of pagans. I deal with a lot of people from every sect, right? But mm-hmm. I will say this, that... Of all of the things that I've studied and I've done my studying, of everything that I've been a part of, everything that I've practiced or or searched through, that there's nothing compares to just simply spending time and in intimacy with Jesus. None of it compares to it. And I, I published an article. It was a really short article, but it simply says the true Christian experience is the mystical experience. There's nothing more intoxicating. There's nothing more satisfying or gratifying to tangibly sit with God for God to literally be in the room with you. And like you said, wanting to hang out with you. I want you to touch on that a little bit, man. Where's I mean, what's the importance of a Christian doing that? Uh, that was a beautiful setup for that. I mean, that's Come on. Yeah, that, that's awesome. man. I, <laughs> I think I'm with you. I believe that that is the most missed aspect of of uh, what we call Christianity mm-hmm. is that the whole purpose for God was to have relationship. Yeah. I mean, it was it, that, that was the whole idea so that he could be amongst his people mm-hmm. and have relationship <laughs> with his people. And he demonstrates that all throughout Scripture. I, I was reading in the book of Revelation where uh, he's talking to the seven churches. Yeah. And he goes to Ephesus mm-hmm. and he, he talks about, boy, you guys are doing a great job. Yeah. You, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're doing the other. He said, but you have forgotten your first love. And then he says, you need to repent. And I was like, wow, you, you mean to tell me that, yeah. you know, these people are doing all these great works, but they're wrong yeah. because they put the works ahead of the God that gave them the duty to begin with. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, he's pointing out right there that it's wrong for us to even teach people. You know, when they first get saved, we want them to get in the choir. We want them to be an usher. We want them to do all these things. Yeah, Yeah, do, do, do. It makes us feel better to see them doing things, you know. (laughs) And so, but the main thing is God himself. Yeah. And uh, we can can explain a little bit by going back to the the Old Testament. The desire of a man's wife in the Old Testament was to bear him some fruit. And so the the idea of marriage in the Old Testament, you know, uh, the concept was that they would have a betrothal uh, agreement uh, and and he would he would give her gifts, uh, you know, and he would go away for a while to build an a, a attachment onto his father's house and and then when his father approved of the attachment that he made to the to the house, then he would go back and he would get his bride. In the meantime, the gifts that he left her were there to help uh, sustain her and keep her, and it showed her value to him as well. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a lot in that. Uh, but but the but the but the true uh, desire that she had was that she bear fruit for her her husband. And so that concept, uh, you know, it's the same because every book of the Bible is basically hidden, written by Hebrew. It's the same concept. Yeah. You know, and so when we get into what we call the New Testament and he begins to talk about two aspects of the spirit that we get confused often. One of them is the gifts of the spirit and the other one is the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so the gifts of the spirit is just simply what we get just by becoming a spouse. Yeah. Just by being in the marriage, we get the opportunity to be pastors and teachers and, and have discernment and, and, and the different gifts of the spirit. Mm-hmm. We, we, we get that uh, in the relationship. But there's, there's some things that cannot happen unless you have intimacy with God. I mean, think about it. In the Old Testament, he would give her gifts, but her, him giving her gifts could not have gotten her impregnated. 
you know, if if she yeah. wanted to be impregnated by her husband, she had to uh, have intimacy with him in order for that thing to happen. She could have all the gifts in the world, but no intimacy, no gift. I mean, no, uh, no fruit. Mm -hmm. And so the fruit of the womb of the woman in the Old Testament is representative of the fruit that we gain from God in the New Testament. We, we accept him as our personal Savior. Of course, we're espoused to him. We're, we're, we're legally betrothed to him. But until you have intimacy with him, then you cannot bear fruit. You, you don't mm -hmm. have long suffering without having int intimacy with God. Yeah. You, can't, you can't love your enemies without uh, you know, uh, having intimacy with God. So it's impossible for a man to bear fruit uh, without having uh, uh, some intimacy with God. And that was the point that, that he was trying to make. And so we had to make a distinction between the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit. I mean, it's an awesome thing. Yeah. And so, uh, and so when we look at it from that perspective, then we understand just like uh, when, when Jesus went to visit Mary and, 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 and uh, Martha, uh, Lazarus was, was not there at the time, and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Yeah. I mean, she was just into him, and Martha was running around fixing food. She was getting him some food together. She was preparing a meal. And uh, what was so awesome about it, Martha, in the process of her working, in the process of her doing something for God, she got ill. She was upset. And she's like, could you tell her, basically, while I'm in here working, could she come in here and help me <laughs> instead of sitting down at your feet? Yeah. And Jesus looked at it and he said, to Martha, Martha. He said, you are coming about many things. He said, but Mary, she has chosen the better part. And he said, that part will not be taken away from her. And I'm going to tell you, man, our rewards are hinged upon this concept yeah. because we can do works in the church yeah. and it might be for a good motive and it might not be for a good motive. I might show up to Ursha because I don't want, uh, I don't want to hear what the other people got to say about me not showing up. I might sing in the choir because I'm trying to present myself as show some holy my roller. Yeah. I might give a gift to somebody or money to somebody because I want to be the one who's the greatest giver in the church. And he said, but those things might be taken away from you in the judgment. He said, but relationship, he said, these tr true relationship will be rewarded. True relationship like Mary had, when, when it comes down to it, these things will not be taken away from her because she's bearing fruit. And her relationship is not dependent upon her works. Because if you're intimate with somebody, if you're laying in the bed with your husband and your wife, and you say, sweetheart, would you, you mind going to get me a glass of water? It's not an issue. You just say, no, no problem. I'll go get you some more. And you go and you do it. That's what intimacy with, with, with our yeah. husband, with our, uh, Christ does. You're intimate with him. And he says, do you mind going over here and speaking to this person? Do you mind going over here and doing that? Well, the intimacy itself drives you to try to please him because intimacy with him lets you know how much he loves and how much he cares about you. But if it's only based upon works, then, uh, you know, Satan gets involved in all that. And he says, why, why are you the only one doing it? Why are you the only one working? Why are you the only one in the choir? Why are you the only one ushering? And it's not, it's not necessarily pure, you know, because our flesh and stuff can get involved in those things. So that's why we have to be willing to bear fruit. And that's how Jesus said we'll be known. He didn't say we would be known, by our gifts. He mm -hmm. said we would be, be known, he said, by our fruit, which he said to love one another. He said, that's how people are going to know your mind. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the, the greatest deception in the world, and I'll stop when I say this, but the greatest deception in the world that the Antichrist will bring up on the world is, is the gifts. Mm -hmm. And when you look at him, he's going to come with great power and lying signs and wonders. And he's going to be so gifted that he's going to fool people into thinking that he himself is God simply by looking at the gift. But the one thing that Satan cannot do is bear fruit and he can never love. And so if you ever see anybody loving, you know that that comes straight from the father. Yeah. But if you, but, but, but just because I'm operating in my gift doesn't necessarily mean that I have relationship. Yeah. The scriptures go on and on and on about, um, 
closing the door to pray and going into your, your prayer closet, going into your secret chamber to pray and spend time with the Lord. Um, and, and that to me is the essence of walking in the spirit because you're, you're, you're spending time with, with Christ and you're conversing, you're talking to him. He's talking back. It's this relationship. And that's the thing we say. It's, it's not about religion. It's, it's about relationship. Well, this is where the relationship goes down is in the wedding chambers is, is when you um, submit to God and put that, that time aside. Many people say that I've talked to, they say, you know, I, you know, I talk to God throughout the day. I talk to God all day. So I don't need to uh, put the, you know, put away some time to go read and, and just, you know, soak in his presence and just talk to him like that. Cause I talk to him all day. I talk mm-hmm. to him when I'm driving. I talk to him in my mind or whatever. People have that, that understanding, but there's something special about stopping what you're doing or maybe having something planned like I need to do this, but I'm going to just spend time with God. I'm just going to go into my room, close the doors, put on some music, get in my scriptures and just tell God what I think about him and allow him to tell me what he thinks about me. And wow. that's, 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 this is what happens. And so um, we, we're talking about walking in the spirit. This is this is it. Uh, going into the room, letting the Lord speak to you. He also said that um, that if you seek him in the secret place that he will tell you things in secret for you to share openly. Exactly. So it's not about just studying and and learning and watching videos and and all of these things. It's about just like what happened to you with this revelation, going into the secret place and allowing God to open up the word uh, to you and show you what he wants you to share with the world. That's how it happens. It's it's how it happens, man. And and there's always a deeper place in God. Mm -hmm. I mean, because he's so huge, so deep, so wide, you know, that we can never get enough. You know, we, we never get there. I don't know what that that there is. You know, (laughs) people who think that they're there, I know I'm not there. I can, you know, there's always improvement. There's always, you know, uh, areas of my life that he can point out to me yeah. where I, I need to do better. It's, 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 I'm not there, you know? Yeah. And so, um, and so that, that means I, I need to go deeper. You know, I can, re- I can reach a certain level where I am, mm-hmm. but he's going to, he, he always, this is what he always does to me. I'll, I'll be doing good and yeah. I can, uh, you know, and, and I'll be going along good with him and he'll be throwing revelation out at me, man. I mean, like crazy. And then yeah. it'll just stop. Yeah. And I'm like, man, what's going on? And he'll point out something to me that I need to work on. Mm-hmm. And at that point, to go I to have the next a level. choice. Yeah. yeah. If I if I refuse to work on it, I can't move to the next level. Yeah. But if 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 I give it up, he take always takes me to that that next level. And these are challenging things that he's asking yeah. us to give up. Yeah. That's part, yeah, that's part of that sanctification process, man. That mm-hmm. that people don't discuss a lot of that stuff openly, but it gets weird that the Lord's wanting to get into the different chambers of your heart and seeing the things that you hold above him. Mm -hmm. And you may, you know, you know, be doing it to help people. You may be doing it just because it's something you want to do as a kid, whatever, like it's different for everybody. But let me ask you this with that. When we talk about that, some people say, okay, yes, I, I just give it to God and it's done. What's the longest time that you've been in that situation where God tells you, Hey, look, I want you to deal with this. And, and, and what he tells me, this is, I'm, I just want to see if he tells you the same thing. If you don't deal with it, we can't spend time together. Like I can't, like you can pray, you can read all you want, but until you address this issue in your heart and deal with this idolatry in your heart, until you deal with that, then it, you know, I'm I'm going to give you the cold shoulder when it comes to my presence. Right. I mean, the longest time is probably probably about three or four years. Yeah, exactly. On something. Man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not a, you know, not for me anyway, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, sometimes it takes a little while <laughs> yeah. for me to for let certain things go or, yeah. or, or decide that I love him more than I love this thing. Uh-huh. And, you know, it, I'm not ashamed of that because I'm proud of the fact that he, 
so graceful and he's so merciful that he continues to work on me and he continues to uh, give me time to let these things go. But I can remember it was before I got married, he was dealing with me, you know, and, uh, you know, I was, of course, you know, we are committing these acts that we shouldn't be committing uh-huh. before we get married and all these type things. And he was just telling me, we're not going in further until you make this right. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, these are decision making times, you yeah. know, you, you got to make a choice and you know, you're not going in the further and, you know, and it finally got to the point where it was just so heavy on me that, you know, I said, uh, yes, Lord, not my will, but thine, mm-hmm. thine be done. And it was not, he was beating me up. With yeah. it. He was just showing me that if this relationship is going to go any further, you've got to let uh, some of these things go. And so he keeps doing it, and we keep moving from one level of faith <laughs> to the next level of faith yeah. to the next level of faith. I'm not there yet. He just recently been showing me, um, you know, okay, he said, you remember when I told you that some things you're not going to be able to shake them except by uh, uh, prayer yeah. and fasting. Uh-huh. And so he's not lying to us. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are some things that we will not be able to conquer unless we fast and pray. And so I'm really now getting into, uh, uh, for the first time, just really concentrating on, 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 on how I'm going to fast and how I'm going to pray. Cause I want to go to that, that next level. You know, it's, it's challenging. Uh, I, I was finally able to go almost seven days in December mm. and, um, you know, just water and yeah. I'm going to try it again, uh, at some point in the near future, try to go at least 10, you know, and pray and fast, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, that's a challenge for me, you know, but, you know, I, I believe in what he says. If, if, if we want to break some yokes, yeah. if, if we want to, uh, you know, shake off some chains, you know, there are some of them that we cannot shake unless yeah. we fast and pray. You know, that's an interesting scripture. I want, I want to stick on intimacy and I know we'll get back to it, but that's an, that's an interesting scripture because I know some of the other translations of the, of the Bible, some of the other versions exclude that, that verse that's not mm-hmm. in some of the versions. And to me, that scripture is so powerful. I feel like that's one that we need. You oh, know? absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm going to tell you, there's certain versions of the Bible that when you read it, th- there has to be an intentional effort to leave certain key scriptures yeah. out. I, I think so as well. I've done the study as well, and that became my message. And you can get you can get carried away with that message. I, I know some people here who um, their message is King James only. Like that's I mean that's their gospel. Mm-hmm. Like they'll go to an unbeliever and ask them what type of Bible they have in their house. They don't, you know what I'm saying? And that, that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they give yeah, out signs and tracks, and that that's their gospel, really. But um. It is important, I mean, though. I think important. it really is important. I mean, important. the King James Version is, is, a, is an awesome version, mm-hmm. but it's still not perfect. I exactly. mean, and, 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 you know, the translation of the King James uh, it was taken from the Masoteric Version of, mm-hmm. of the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, which was altered, altered in the sense that they put vowels, that, you know, because the original Hebrew language doesn't have vowels. Mm-hmm. So they put vowels in, uh, in the text. And in the process of doing that, it was a few little things that got changed. And so when you... You go back and you know with the with the de- with the uh, advent of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, you can see a few things that may have you know uh, changed, and then you see it also in the translation a few things that were uh, kind of left out. And I, I give you one, and we'll move on to the in- intimacy again. You know, like when you're reading in the in the New Testament, you know the word Easter shows up. Exactly. You know, but in reality, there is no Easter for for uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the church. There's no such thing. It's it's Passover. You yeah. know, it's Passover and, and unleavened bread and first fruits. Exactly, and that's what and it was you, talking about there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you look it up in the original Greek, the word Easter was the same word that they had been translating Passover all the other times in the scripture. But all of a sudden, they decided in the English to use the word Easter. Why? Because there was an agenda somewhere. Yeah. You know, and uh, we really don't have a lot of time getting that, but there's an agenda out there. Exactly. To do that. We'll definitely have you back on for another show with that, because that's something that I've studied with and been passionate about in the past as well. But yeah, getting back to the, the intimacy, intimacy thing, when, when, when God speaks to your heart and tells you, look, you need to lay this down and it's different for everybody. And I kind I'm, I'm having fun talking about this a little bit because a lot of these things are kind of embarrassing to talk about. Right. You know, these different chambers of our hearts, these different things that we exalt over God. 
and you tell people and you're kind of embarrassed because you're like, really, you held that over intimacy with God? Like, I would never do that in a million years, you know? Um, but the more I'm talking about it with other people in private, I'm finding out like, well, I'm not the only one on this, this, uh, this trip. Like, you know, other people are, are experiencing the same things. And, and, you know, like you said, about three years, it was something that the Lord was dealing with me with uh, about listening to a particular type of music. And I want to say that we get so possessive. We think that God wants to take it away and never give it back. But all he wants to do is purify it. He wants to take it and he wants to uh, make sure that you love him more than you love that thing. And that's something exactly. that we, you know, we have these different plans and desires. And, you know, we, the scripture says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And you say, exactly. you know what? That's my desire. I want to do this with my life. I want to be a preacher. I want to do this. He's like, well, no, you give me that. You give up on being a preacher. And you're like, and you're like traumatized. Like, oh my <laughs> God, I've studied my whole life. Like, what are you exactly. doing? No, I'm going to preach or whatever. And then the fact that you give it to him, he purifies it and he makes you a better preacher than you can ever be. But people get so scared that he's going to take it away and, and keep it and all of these things. And I'm I'm just trying to give you wisdom. Whatever the Lord says, do you have to do it in purity and love. And it's not the scripture also says that he has plans to bless you and not to harm you. Exactly. So it's not like he's punishing you. And the whole thing about um, him giving us the desires of our hearts is once we come to him, he renews our hearts yes. and then our, our desires have to be transformed into his desires, his desires. Wow, and let, yeah. let him give us his desires and let us walk in that. And he will openly exalt you. He will put you where you need to be. He'll give you provision. He'll give you dreams and revelations. He'll move the heavens and earth for you as a son, as a daughter to walk in your calling. All you got to do is trust him. All you got to do is walk in him. That's, that's wisdom. That, I mean, that's key. That word you just say it was trust. And so when you begin to talk about trust, you know, if, if I trust you, I might tell you some things Yeah. that, uh, you know, I wouldn't tell anybody else. You know how we, we all have this best friend that we'll tell a little mm -hmm. bit more than we tell anybody <laughs> else. Yeah, yeah. And it's because we trust him with the information. Yeah. And, you know, people say, you know, they might look at me or you and they say, well, I would never put that before God. Yeah. But I can guarantee you with 100% assurity because scripture say it, they have something in their life that they're putting ahead of God. Yeah. And so we all have something. And so, you know, but he want us to see it for ourselves and trust him with it, however vile, however awful, however, whatever it is, and to tell him about it. And if we don't tell him about it, that tells him that we don't trust him yet. You know, and so there's not anything that we can't go to him with that he hadn't paid the price for, that he hadn't suffered for. It's, regardless of how dark it is, how, mm -hmm. how it, we can go to him with it and trust him with it to help us out with with that thing. And and it may take, you know, years, you know, to transform us in, in, uh, in, in shape us and mold us. But yeah. the promise is that he's going to do it. He, mm -hmm. He's the great potter. He'll break us down and build us back up again and break us back down. And, you know, even when we bear fruit, you know, he uses, uh, you know, that as an example. He says he's still going to prune us so we can even bear more fruit. Mm -hmm. So there's always improvement that, that we can we can achieve through Christ. Yeah, it says that he will complete the good work in which he started in you. He's, so don't get exactly. weary and well-doing. Just know that you're in a good place. You're in a good place. You know, if he's dealing with you, if he's if he's chastising you, you're in a good place because you understand that he only does that to his children. Exactly. He chastises those of which he loves and he loves his children. He loves each and every one of us. And so that's the thing when we uh, walk in that love and take that love and in, in intimacy and like I've heard it said that if you don't know where to go with God, if you don't know what to do next, go back to the last thing you know that he said. And like you were saying, it may have been three years ago, and I and I was one who walked that out. I had something I was was holding from the Lord for about three years, playing in bars and doing music, and I was doing heavy metal music, and the Lord wanted to take that from me at the time, and I was, I wanted it so bad that was my dream, and and I wouldn't get I wouldn't give it to him, and but I would still try to do Bible studies. I would still show up at church and try to get in worship, and I right. would have my <laughs> hands lifted, and I because I'm I'm addicted to the presence of God. Like that's my intoxication. Like there's no greater substance on this on this earth than feeling His tangible oil. 
just his oil, his presence, man. And so I would be worshiping God and I, I could feel when the anointing comes and I can feel when his presence uh, goes in my body and, and cleans out the different areas of my body that needs work. He does that with his presence. Yes. And so um, I would feel it coming and then it would hit a brick wall and turn around and go the other way. And he says, look, you're not getting it until you deal with what I told you to. And it's almost like he's tempting me with his presence, man. <laughs> and that's not a good place to be. I, and I have to sit down and, and cry, you know, and sit down and ponder in my heart man, what do I want more? And that's simply all he asks. What do you want more? Do you want your desires? Do you want that relationship? Do you want that pornography? Do you want the alcohol, the pills? What do you want more? That or me. And I'm telling you what, there's nothing that you can give up on this earth that you're not going to receive him 10 times fold. Because when it comes to getting our rewards from, from God and God blessing us with rewards, he is our reward. His yes. presence is our reward. He is our inheritance. There's nothing that nobody can give and nobody can take away that is, is comes in comparison with just simply sitting in his presence and, and, and supping with God. And I'm telling you, like I said, I want to reiterate the, the mystical experience, the prayers and meditations and yoga, all that stuff. If that's what you do, it's whatever. But none of it compares to simply getting in the presence of God and spending time with Jesus, Jesus by name, calling by name. And, I sh- I, and if you don't believe in him, if you don't think he's real, if you think it's a theory or whatever, I tell you what, you're in a perfect place for God to reveal himself to you. So all I would say is just say, just ask him, Jesus, if you're real, show yourself to me. If you're real, prove yourself to me. And if you mean that with a sincere heart, I guarantee you, that you're going to have an encounter with God. I don't know Absolutely. when it's going to happen, but you can, you, I, I'll bet my life on that message. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, you know, we just trust. We got to trust him. Uh, he's proven himself over and over and over and over again to me. And that's why I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I wrote the book so that I could share, you know, some of the revelations he gave to me. Uh, you could talk to any mathematician, and you could just pick out the things. This just in this little book I wrote. <laughs> of the things that he fulfilled yeah. just, and mathematically it is impossible. You could probably win the lottery several times over before one man could have fulfilled all the things that he did in this book. And so he proves himself. If we open ourselves to it and say, okay, if, if, if you're real, show yourself, he will reveal himself. Mm-hmm. It's an awesome thing. Yeah. So, We're coming up on the end of the show, and I just wanted to set it up, man. This has been an awesome fellowship, really. It's it's been awesome (laughs) fellowship in the spirit, and I'm I'm glad we've done this show. Um, There was a lot of good insight that we talked about, and even with the revelation that you were given. And there was so much more, man, that we were just touching on that I'm like, I want to take him down this path of what he just said because there's so much more around it that simply just paints a picture of Jesus, man. He uses parables and the things around us in our lives. And yes, he uses a worm. He uses snakes. He uses all kind of animals. And the deep part about it, and you kind of touched on it, but to represent him and to represent other entities as well. These different demonic entities in the scriptures are known of, of as birds and as animals and things like that. But he's really talking about spiritual principalities and powers. So I want to get you on another show to go into some more detail about that as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll That's have to a do good this one. again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We barely scratched the surface. I know I think, <laughs> it's hard to stay on, on topic, but I know yeah. that man. I, and I just prayed before we had this show and I just asked God to get the glory from it. And, um, and I think he did. So what I want to ask you to do is, I, I, if if you don't mind, I want you to pray for some of the listeners. With everything going on, on right now and, and the elections and the confusion and the chaos that many brothers and sisters are caught up in. I had I, I had people leave from my house last week in a shouting match about who they were voting for and people almost in tears. And I've transcended that. I, I understand the spirit behind that. But people who are just freaking out because they have their trust in this kingdom. I want to ask you to pray, man, for people just to be loosed from the kingdom and the desires of this world and just to experience an intimacy with Christ, which is the kingdom revealed in us that we can come into right relationship and he'll, he'll have us to trust in his kingdom, man. So if you, I just want you to be led of the spirit. And uh, if you don't mind praying for our listeners. Absolutely. 
Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity. We want to thank you for being God, and we want to thank you for being God all by yourself. We know that you sit on the circle of the earth, and heaven is your throne, and earth is your footstool. Father, you said you are Alpha and Omega, and that you are our beginning and our very end. It's in you that we live, and it's in you that we move, and it's in you that we have our very being. Lord, we're living in a world of deception right now. We're living in a world that's on one side or the other. And, Lord, you ask us as your people to understand that we don't live in a democracy. We live in a theocracy. You want us to understand, Lord, that we follow by your paths and not by the paths of other men. Lord, you want us to understand that we shouldn't put our trust in the princes and the systems Mm -hmm. of this world, that we come from a different kingdom, that we are sojourners through this this land, and that we should store our treasures up with you, Lord, and store our treasures up doing it the way that you would have us to do it, knowing that there might be opposition and knowing that we may get persecuted for it and knowing that people are not going to like us for it. But, Lord, give us the strength and the mind. Lord, we're being deceived as a nation right now. We're being deceived to thinking that this nation is great, not knowing that you're the one, if yes. we were great, you're the one that made it great. Lord, we, we deceive ourselves because you, you told us that the reason, the reason that you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was because she had fullness of bread and because she had too much pride and that she wouldn't lift her hand to, 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 to feed the poor. Lord, we're looking at this nation right now these are the symptoms that we have right now as well lord and we ask that you well, won't allow our people to be deceived open up our hearts and open up our minds lord so we might see you and not see our, our political process we might see you and not see the the arguments that's going on because lord you said you're not uh, in the spirit of confusion so if, if there's confusion lord we know you're not in the midst of it open up our hearts open up our mind so we might receive what you have called us to receive so we might become who you have called us to become in your Son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys receive that, man. That's powerful. That's for you guys to receive that tangible power of prayer. It's just not something we do to close a um, a get-together or a gathering or a church service. Like, prayer is powerful. Prayer shakes nations. Prayer moves kingdoms. Um, just to reiterate off of that, the scripture says, cursed is the man that trusteth in man. So don't wow. look to the rulers of this world um, for your bread. Don't, you know, you know, that's, that's the thing, man. And just understand that your inheritance comes from God. Your provision comes from God. And if, there, if, if, if we trust in him, everything's going to be okay. I want you guys to go out and check out the book by Kendall Shoulders. Jesus is a worm, a snake too, and among other things. So he has two books put into one on here. You can pick up this book at mythicist.me. We're going to have a link to the book as well. And you can go to Jesus is a worm. Dot com. Let us know in the comments and description, like if you guys want Kendall to come back on the show. This is one of the best shows I think I've done. So I'm definitely going to have him back. But yeah, just leave me a comment, man. Let me know if you guys got anything out of this show. Thanks so much for coming on, Kendall. Hey, God bless you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, blessings, man. Shalom. All right. Today's podcast is brought to you by WebCreatorPros.com. If you're looking for a professional website at an affordable price, head on over to WebCreatorPros.com. Type in the promo code TRUTH to save $200 on your first website, webcreatorpros.com. This episode is also brought to you by Kendall Shoulders in his new book, Jesus is a Worm and a Snake Too, among other things. Jesusisaworm.com. The book deals with many different prophecies and dark sayings of Jesus, uh, particularly Jesus calling himself a worm and King David prophesying of the coming Christ, calling him a worm too. What does this mean? I know for me personally, when I read over it in the scriptures, I would just kind of read past it and didn't know what it means. So for the first time, you're going to find out what it means when Jesus says, I am a worm. It's pretty deep stuff, guys. Check out the book, JesusIsAWorm.com. If you would like to sponsor the show or advertise on the Mythicist podcast, you can do so by going to www.mythicist.me and click on Sponsor the Show for more info. If you would like to support the show financially, you can do that also by going to mythicist.me and become a monthly supporter. We appreciate your monthly support. Won't you come, come and take me away? Today's podcast is brought to you by webcreatorpros.com. 
If you're looking for a professional website at an affordable price, head on over to webcreatorpros.com, type in the promo code TRUTH to save $200 on your first website, webcreatorpros.com. This episode is also brought to you by Kendall Shoulders in his new book, Jesus is a Worm and a Snake Too, 